And so guys, if you're following along in your bulletins, we're now going to sing, or actually pray, uh, that prayer that our Lord taught his disciples to pray, the Lord's Prayer, by praying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so this morning our scripture reading comes from two places. The first one uh, comes from the Old Testament, and it comes from the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. The word of God through the prophet declares, When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my court? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocation, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul, hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then our reading from the New Testament comes from the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 10, and beginning in verse 17. Now, for those of you that remember the last time I was here, this is the same passage I read from. This is basically part two of that message. We'll be getting into Christmas-themed messages as we go through December, but I felt that we still needed to finish something off here in uh, this passage of Mark chapter 10. Okay? So it's the same passage. It comes from Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 31. Again, the word of God said, and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all of these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, 
houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Yes. All right. So this morning we're continuing our study in the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31 is what was just read. The central idea of this passage is this. That joyous fulfillment, joyous fulfillment is found in Jesus Christ and anything else. Wealth, possessions, people, relationships, worldly pleasures will leave you unsatisfied and unfulfilled. Now, hey, you tell a 20-year-old that, a young person that, they may scratch their head and go, oh, okay, maybe, maybe. <laughs> but we, in this room, have lived long enough to say amen to that. We've been around the block or two and have some experience and go, yeah, all these things that the world promises will make me happy and fulfill me. Yeah, it hasn't fulfilled me and done it for me. And so we all feel what I just said from this passage, and that is that real satisfaction and fulfillment will come from your God, God Jesus, alone. So, the last time, we saw this theme developing through three questions, okay? And it still stands right now. Three questions. The first one, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That comes from the uh, rich young ruler. We talked about that last time, and boy, what an important question. <laughs> okay, we looked at that last time I was with you. This time now, the second question, then who can be saved? We're going to deal with that. Third question is, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? That's borrowed from Matthew's exact account of this same passage in Mark. What then will we have? We'll look at that down the road, probably after Christmas. But for today, we're going to look at the second question. And that is, then who can be saved? All right. So these, this is in verses 23 through 27. All right? Verses 23 through 27. So we're going to look at it in two parts. First of all, will the amazed reaction of the disciples, and they ask this question. That's the first part. But then the second part is the response of Jesus to their question. Okay? So let's begin with the first part. The disciples ask, who then can be saved? All right. So they ask this because they're amazed by something Jesus said. And what is it? He says how difficult it will be for those who have wealth or are rich to enter the kingdom of God. Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So you see, Jesus is doing something Pretty amazing here to that ear, to that thinking of that culture at that time. He flips the, the conventional thinking upside down. See, in that time, in Jewish culture, they would have thought, as many do today, they would have thought that wealth is a sign of God's blessing and God's special love and favor for you. Because, wow, he gave you so much wealth. To make your life easier on this earth. He must really love you more than us. Think about Christmas time. Uh, if you haven't had a brother or a sister and they got five Christmas gifts, but you got four, you would feel, ah, Dad and Mom love you more because you got one extra gift than I did, right? You, we all feel that and all sense that or might think that. Well, that's the same elementary idea when it comes to wealth in people's thinking, especially in that time of the disciples, that if you've got more than me, I guess daddy loves you more. Okay? That was the thinking. And so Jesus pops that. He deflates that idea. And is in, 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 in saying that just because you have wealth doesn't mean you have some special relationship with God or you're better than the other people. No. God has given that to you for a reason, sure, but it doesn't mean that your, your way to heaven and that you have this special thing with him is necessarily true. What is true is he flips it and says, actually, your wealth, a person who's wealthy, 
can actually be a stumbling block and a roadblock for you to actually get to heaven. Why? Now, why would he say that? Because typically, if you have someone of wealth and means, typically they're going to feel more confident and secure and, and at peace within that wealth and feel less of a desire for the need of God and, and God's help. And so they, they, they find their confidence and security in life in their things. And so I don't, I, don't, I, I don't have a need for a lot of stuff. And so they don't sense a need for God or even a gratitude. Often, not always, but often that's what begins to happen. Also, you, you just see it over and over. Typically, uh, people that have a lot of wealth will begin to become fixated on it. They'll love it, they'll pursue it, they'll want to amass it, they're worried that somebody's going to try to take it. So they're consumed with the idea of this. Again, there are exceptions, but that's generally what happens and why he would make such a comment. Okay, It's not what I'm living for. I'm not living for God. I'm living for that, my stuff, and the kind of cars I have in the garage. So, so, so. Listen to the warning of Jesus elsewhere. He says, there are those who hear the word, the word of God, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful because they're consumed and worried about these other things. Another time, Jesus warns, listen to this very carefully, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Wow, he just laid it down right there. So he's, he's, so he's, he's explaining what happens when there's wealth in the issue here. Okay, how it becomes difficult. So, uh, when they hear this from Jesus, and he flips the conventional thinking upside down, instead of well being a, a sign of God's special relationship with you, it actually can hinder you from God, they then respond, well, wait a minute, do you mean that we can't be good enough or rich enough, uh, meaning God likes me to enter into heaven? Then who can be saved? And that is less of a question and more of a realization, uh-oh, we're screwed. Because, because we thought that a rich guy had it made. They're, they're at the front of the line, and they're going to go to heaven, and, and we were sort of in the back of the line, but if they're going to have problems, what does that mean for us? Who then, if they can't get in so easily, who then can get in? Right? That's what they're asking. And this brings us to our second part, and that is what Jesus answers with. He says, right here, listen to it very carefully to answer their question. Dave, here it is. With man, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. So too often we have this attitude of all things are possible with man. <laughs> but again, I think we've lived long enough in this room. We have enough experience uh, to know that that's not necessarily true. I, I think that if we all unite and we're all a positive mind and working together, we can achieve a lot of things. Absolutely. Man, this country put a man on the moon. I mean, there's, it's, there's no telling what we could do when we put our heads and minds together, right? This country, this country has done so many great things together. But, but what Jesus is talking about is something that's impossible for man to do, and that is to spiritually bring himself back to life. Uh, when something is dead, it is dead. Is this alive? No. It's a, it's a material object, but it's not a living thing. Can this thing do anything by itself on its own? No. No. And so it is with our dead souls. He is saying if you're dead, you're as dead as that doorknob and can do nothing to save yourself. And that is why it takes an act of God, okay, to breathe life into the situation. Here's why. Romans 3, verse 10 says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. 
all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. What's all mean? All means all, that's all all means. Every single one of us in this room, God is saying, you have offended me or fallen short. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the Bible explains, beginning with the first man, the human race has fallen into a state of rebellion and sin and is dead spiritually. Dead spiritually. And so Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we're dead in our trespasses. So do you get the point? Do you see what Jesus is saying here? He is saying you're not capable of saving yourself. So what does it take? How then can we be saved? Who can be saved? But how can we be saved? And that is this, by an act of God. Let me put it this way. Uh, in Christ alone. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. How can we be saved? In Christ alone, but by God's grace alone. Ephesians 2 tells us, But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. How can we be saved? In Christ alone, by God's grace alone, but also through faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And of course, Hebrews eleven six 6 proclaims, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So grace means, listen, grace means undeserved favor. And if you ever get into the realm of saying, God must save me, God must love me, God is obligated to do this for me or save me, You've got it all wrong because that's no longer grace. Grace means undeserved favor. We don't deserve to be saved or, or have uh, goodness from him. We actually deserve to get slapped and go to hell because we have offended and rebelled against him. But he does, he surprises us and does something the opposite. Instead of pimp slapping us, he gives us love and salvation. Uh, I have an older brother, I'm the youngest, and I learned how to drive a car back in Philadelphia on the east side of Pennsylvania, Harry. And I learned how to drive, some of you remember these cars, okay, in 1978, Chrysler Newport. Do you remember those cars? They're, they're big dinosaur boats, man. I could, I could be sitting here, I could be sitting here reach out with my arm and never touch the other person, the other person felt like they were sitting over here. I mean, it was huge, uh, huge eight, car. Eight line, four, uh, four and two tons. Yes, yes. <laughs> Mopar power, man. That, that, the cubic inch, massive engine. Uh, you could work on the engine back then. Today's cars, forget about it. But, uh, so I learned how to drive in that car in the streets of Philly. And, uh, and so I was driving one, but it was my brother's car. And I was driving one morning, doing my stuff. I actually clipped the front left uh, where the headlight was. I hit something and damaged it. It was, it was a minor damage, but cosmetic, but enough, you know, damage that would cost money to fix it. And uh, I was scared to death. My brother was a football player. He was bigger than me, stronger than me. He, 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 he had a, a, a short fuse and could get angry and explode very easily, you know. Uh, my big brother, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was dreading it as I drove home. I go into the house. He's just waking up. Uh, it's still morning, and I'm like shaking in my boots. And I say to my brother, I said, uh, he goes, well, how did everything go this morning? And <laughs> I go, well, it went good, but uh, I got to tell you something. And I just spit it out what happened to his car. He went, what? He throws his shoes on, doesn't say much. He just throws his shoes on, goes out and says, come with me. We go outside to the car and he looks at all the damage. He, he walks around the car, looks where the damage is, checks it out, never says a word. 
And then he turns to me, and I'm expecting the worst. And he turns to me and he says, are you hungry? 